I wanted to talk a little bit more about setting bias in a class AB amplifier. This is sort of a follow-up to my last couple videos. I've talked about this um, in other videos about the Tigers and everything else for uh, years and years here. Anyway, just to go over, I've gone over this in a lot of videos, but I just want to go a little more clarity. So your output current is going to go through one transistor or the other to the speaker. So one transistor turned on, all the current's flowing through both of these resistors. Say this is the transistor that's turning on for the positive cycle. So this transistor turns on, goes out. Or this transistor turns on, and it goes through these two resistors, out. So all of your current, all of your output current, is going through this RE, you know, at, at a certain time anyway. And I drew these double-ended, so like, um, sometimes the output is, probably most commonly, the emitters go to the output, but also the collectors can go to the output, different configurations. If the emitters are going to the output, in the old days, a real common circuit was just to throw a couple diodes across, a dot designating that they're on the heat sink, to, so they track the temperature a little bit. And the little resistors, usually like a 0.1, is real typical for RE, could be 0.22 or 0.39 or anything in that range. Um, I'm going to use 0.1 in this example, but you could always just change it. At any rate, so that's your current. With no signal coming to the amp, you've got a certain amount of current flowing through here in an AB type amplifier. You've got a certain set amount of current flowing straight through, basically, the whole core of the amp. It doesn't even go through the speaker, it just goes straight through. That's your idle current. This is no input or anything. I mean, this is a steady idle current going through. The purpose of the idle current is to get rid of those glitches at the crossover. When you see a Class B amp, it has horrible cross crossover glitches as it passes the zero center. Um, this makes that not happen. It, it takes that nonlinearity area out of the equation by just saturating voltage to that nonlinear portion of the curve for both halves. And you get a nice linear amplifier. So the method of actually measuring and setting, say you've got a amplifier, you don't know how to set the idle current on it, you at least want to check it. Um, so I go same method, fixed. If it's a fixed amplifier, it's probably class AB1. Just check the RE, check the voltage, clamp a, volt, a voltmeter in millivolt range across the RE resistors. Use that value for RE. Say it was a 0.1 in this example, but you could just, like I said, manipulate your equation here. If I wanted 50 milliamps of bias current, and I have a 0.1 ohm emitter resistors, then 50 milliamps times 0.1, 5 millivolts. I'm looking for 5 millivolts on this meter. And that's my bias. That's a maximum. 50 is just a number that's very commonly used in a lot of amplifiers. It's usually the most you can get away with. You're running 50 milliamps and the amplifier is going to be warm to the touch. So you're kind of getting towards the hairy edge um, in most cases. You know, and, and that can vary. You know, if, if you do have manufacturer's instructions, of course you're going to use those. If it's fixed, just check, make sure you're not unbalanced and uh, all that. If um, the other method that I usually most commonly use, and I'm using in all my demonstrations, is to set the idle current to X, usually 50 milliamps. The best way, actually, though, is to set it by distortion. And there's a couple ways you can do that. You can, uh, you know, if you have a distortion meter, obviously, or you have a method like John uses on a, using the FFT in an oscilloscope. But even if you just have a common oscilloscope and use like a maybe say 10 kilohertz or something like that, a sine wave, and look just real carefully at the crossover point, before, you know, have the bias turned all the way down, off, you'll have big nasty crossover points in your, on your screen, you'll be able to see it by the eye. So just zoom your scope in, you know, so you just look at those little bits of the screen where you got, you know, so you'd be looking at a chopped off square wave almost, it's actually a sine wave, but you have most of the sine wave off the screen. 
So you're just showing those little vertical spots where you got the glitches in, and then just turn your bias up till the glitches disappear. And um, you know, use maybe 50 as a maximum for that. But even if you have an amp set to 50 and you can get away with turning the bias down to 35, well, there's no there's no disadvantage in doing that. I mean, it's all advantage. Your amp will run cooler and be safer. But that's not typically usually. It usually takes pretty close to that 50 to make them totally get rid of the distortion that you gained from the uh, crossover notch. If you can't get to the RE's, for some reason the RC is more available than the RE. Say this is your RC and this is your RE. If it was the uh, red here. Um, well then use the RC. It's going to be very close to the RE. The only difference is the you know additional current of the uh, base current. Otherwise it's the same current. So if you can't get to the RE, you can use the RCs. And then whatever the value of the resistor you're using, times whatever current you're aiming for, multiply that out and you'll get your voltage you're looking for in your test meter. So that's that method. And the final caveat I wanted to men mention was um, don't mistake an offset control for a bias control because you could really mess yourself up. And offset something you should really check before you even start to even look at bias. Make sure you don't have an offset because that'll throw everything off.